But uh, this sermon this week's a little different than that. It's called Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind. And uh, I'll give you the reason for that in a second. But Acts chapter 27. Acts 27. Begin reading in verse 1. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band. And entering into a ship of Adramedium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. All right, now look at verse number 9. And now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage. That's always a blessing. <laughs> Honey, I perceive that your trip is going to be with much hurt and damage. Yeah, ouch. <laughs> you hear those words, well, you might want to take a step back and wait another day. Yeah, yeah. Um, not only of the leading in ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things were spoken by Paul. They're always going to trust the money. They're going to trust yeah. the Lord. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Fenice and there to winter, which is a haven of Crete and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had attained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not, not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euroclidon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. Brother Dave Jr., would you pray, sir? Well, the Lord be able to come to church today, God, and get preached at, and get taught. Uh, out of your word, bring help us to be good stewards of these things, apply them in our lives. Uh, Lord, when we leave the church house, we think on them. And meditate on and do what you would have us to do with them. Thank you, Lord, for the pastor of the local church, Lord, to be able to come in and uh, enjoy these blessings uh, and these privileges of being your children. Thank you. Just ask, Lord, you accomplish a purpose now in each every uh, heart here Thank you. and uh, do what you would have to do for yes. each and every one of us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Thank you for standing. I will try to get uh, through this this morning. There's a lot uh, that needs to be said that uh, I'd like to preach about. It's been on my heart for a couple of weeks. Now, last week I preached to you about how in John chapter 3, verse 8, the Bible says, The wind bloweth where it listed. Right. And I preached to you there about how the wind blows. And you can't always see how God is working and how God is moving. But rest assured, whether you can determine it or not, understand it or not, God is always at work. And God is likened unto the wind. The Holy Spirit of God is likened unto wind. Now, if that is true, if there is a holy wind and a holy spirit, you know the devil is a great counterfeiter, yeah, right. a great imitator, yeah. uh, a great counterfeit to the things of God. The devil will uh, deceive people. The devil will use the same tactics that can be described in much the same way as an unholy wind. An unholy spirit being an unholy wind. And so I want to preach about gone with the wind. What happens if you get caught up in that unholy wind? What happens if you get deceived by that, by that devil? Uh, by the serpent there. What happens if you get blown with the wind? Uh, what should we do? How do we recover ourselves? And what should we watch out for? In Acts chapter 2 verse 2. Uh, type picture of the Holy Spirit. By, and wind there. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit showed up. Like a mighty rushing wind. I'll tell you right now that when you read the Bible. The word wind showed up over and over and over again. And sometimes that wind is a great picture of how God moves. Other times, there's a wind in the Bible that's a great picture of how the devil moves. And uh, we know that God and the devil are contrary uh, one to the other. In Job chapter 1, verse 19, the devil says, uh, God, you put a hedge of protection around Job. Let me get at him. And God says, all right, there's the circle of hedge I put around him. You've never been able to get in, him in there before. Today, I'm going to move the hedge a little bit, and you can go, but you are limited to what you can do. 
And that Bible says right out the gate that the devil came with a mighty wind and he brought the house down upon Job. That's an unholy wind. That's the devil using a wind to destroy the things in Job's life. Well, a wind can uh, destroy your life. A wind from the devil can destroy your family. A wind from the devil can destroy your faith. A wind from the devil, an unholy wind, can drive you away from God so that you are now gone with the wind. Look at Acts chapter 27 verse 4. I know it's a peculiar topic and a peculiar thought from such a chapter as this. But look at Acts 27 verse 4. The Bible says that when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were what? Contrary. There it is. You have, a, you have a picture here of God's wind versus the devil's wind. Contrary one to the other. Uh, God's wind blows contrary to the devil's wind. Uh, God's wind is always there to help you. God's wind is always there to build your strength, increase your strength. Uh, God's wind is there uh, for your good, Romans 8, 28. And even if God has to allow the devil to come in and use his wind against you, God ultimately knows that that's going to help you or can help you. But the devil, when he sends a wind, it's not there to help you. It's not there to build you up. It's not there to strengthen your faith. It is there to destroy you, to crush you, to drive you so far away from God you can't even recognize that you were even saved ever one time in your life. These two things work contrary to the other. There's an unholy wind uh, that are contrary one to another. In Mark chapter 6, verse 48, the Bible says, And he saw them, the disciples, God saw them, toiling in rowing. For the wind was contrary to them. Mark chapter 6 verse 48. God sends them out into the midst of a storm. And a wind begins to blow. And the, and the disciples begin to try to row. And they can't because the wind is contrary to them. That wind will stop you from going to places that God wants you to go. And God will allow it because he eventually wants you to live by faith. And walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. But that devil he's only there to capsize your ship. The unholy wind of the world, the flesh, and the devil blows contrary to the wind of God. Our bodies are called vessels. And as such, and as they are called vessels, so too are ships called vessels. Mm -hmm. Our bodies and ships are very similar. Uh, our bodies are supposed to have the Lord Jesus Christ as the captain of our salvation. Yes. And we are to be filled with the wind. We are to be filled with the Spirit. But if we're not careful, if we're not mindful... Uh, our vessels, our, our bodies, our ships, uh, as it were, uh, can be driven and blown away by an unholy wind. The desire is to knock you off course. Right. James chapter 3, verse 4, the Bible says this, Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds. Mm -hmm. Ships, they're great. You might be a great a mighty man for God. You might be saved 30, 40 years. I think you've got it all figured out. But that Bible says that there are winds that drive ships away. And the wind there is likened unto your tongue. And what little member it is. It don't take much to drive your big mighty ship away. Just one wind or one tongue can do it. Don't believe me? Just wait till somebody discourages you. And see how quickly you are driven away. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14 says this, that we, be, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every, catch it, wind of doctrine. Doctrine is likened unto wind. And there are false doctrines, there are unholy doctrines that are sent by the devil to drive Christians out of church. To, depart, to cause Christians to depart from the faith and destroy their faith, the devil will send an unholy wind to toss you to and fro. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The devil will always watch, wait, and then he'll come to you. James 1.6 says this, But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Faith is likened unto wind, or the lack of faith is likened unto wind. 
where there's no faith, it's very easy to be driven to places that God doesn't want you to go. I want to give you quickly three ways that an unholy wind blows to cause you to become God with the wind. Look at verse 13. Verse 13. And when the south wind blew softly. Now, I don't understand it all, but when I hear south wind, I immediately think the devil. <laughs> God's north, right. the devil's south. Mm -hmm. So when I hear about south wind, I don't know if that's north blowing south or south blowing north. I don't really know, but all I know is the word south and the word wind are connected there. And I know God is north. I know the devil is south. Yep. Hello, retirees. <laughs> Retiring south. <laughs> You're deceived by a false uh, devil. <laughs> it's an unclean spirit that takes people out of the north and brings them south. Whoa. Well, I almost believe that with all my heart. Almost. Yeah. You get right with God, you'll come back north. Ain't that right, sister? She agrees. She came back up this way. What does that say there? It says, when the south wind, look at this, blew softly. The first thing I want to bring to your attention by way of how does an unholy wind work, it blows softly. It don't always blow tempestuously. It don't always blow mightily. It don't always blow the house down. You know Where do they get that from? The three little pigs, mm -hmm. I'll puff and I'll puff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. That's right out of the book of Job. Yeah. Uh, those three little pigs are devils. Yeah. Remember where those devils went, ran into? Yeah. Pigs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it blows softly. You know, the devil works wily. Mm -hmm. The devil works subtly. Mm -hmm. you, might all, you might think, well, he works in loud and, and, and boisterous ways. No, not always. A lot of times in that Bible where he shows up with a soft, gentle breeze, a soft, gentle wind. Why? Because it puts you at ease. It takes the pedal off the metal a little bit. It kind of makes you feel a little comfortable about what you're hearing. Let me tell you what's the, pro the problem with a soft wind or a soft voice is that you must be more discerning about whose voice is talking and what it is saying. Y'all remember the story of Elijah? The Bible says there was a mighty wind, and the Lord was not in that one. Then there was a great earthquake, and God was not in that one. But then there was a still, small voice, and God was in that one. But you know, over in the book of Job, the Bible says that the Lord spoke to Job out of a mighty whirlwind. God don't always, you think, we tend to like Elijah's still, small voice. But that's not how God talks to everybody. God talked to Job out of a whirlwind. He talked to Elijah out of a soft wind, a gentle wind. And the devil does the same thing. He will use a mighty wind, but he'll also use a soft wind. The problem with the still small voice we also desperately want from God, like Elijah got it, the problem with that kind of voice is you have to be really discerning about whose voice it is. And the softer the voice the more attentive you have to be to the voice. The softer the voice, the closer you got to get to the person who's speaking. And if it's God, well, that's great. Because the, the softer God speaks, the closer I got to get to God. That's wonderful. But what if it's not God speaking, it's the devil speaking? Now how close does the devil have your ear? You ever have those moments where you're driving down the road or you're in your house and you get a thought and you meditate upon that thought? And you kind of recite that thought and work that thought through. Sometimes it's God putting that thought there. But the Bible talks about the fiery darts of the wicked. There are some soft thoughts, some soft voices that come to you in the middle of the night. Not all, not all. God speaks in dreams. He, he does. Job says he does. Give us songs in the night. I thank God for the songs of God at night. But if you think the only one, the only one singing songs to you at night is God... There's a soft voice that will blow and whisper sweet nothings in your ear as you got to get close enough to hear it. And once you're that close, boy, are you in danger. You're in danger. Reminded of Little Red Riding Hood. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Little Red Riding Hood, the wolf dressed up as grandma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She got real close enough to be able to see his teeth mm -hmm. and see his tongue and hear his voice. That's the last thing she saw. The problem with the soft wind. You know, John the Baptist, the Bible says that, he says, what for? What went you in for to hear? 
A reed shaken with the wind? A man of soft raiment? John the Baptist didn't preach with a soft voice. I'll tell you this, you got to be careful with those soft voice preachers. Those guys that will just get up there and whisper to you from behind the pulpit. That will just want to encourage you with sweet nothings. You want to preach, that Bible says, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. And declare and show my people their sins and their transgressions. God desires his preachers, his pastors, his men to lift up their voices like a trumpet and declare something. Amen. Not whispers. What are you looking for? A reed shaking in the wind? That wasn't John the Baptist. He preached. You know what the devil will show up to you when you're discouraged most? When you're discouraged most, the devil will show up to you and that's about the time he'll say... I heard of a pastor recently. He went to a revival meeting. He preached a revival meeting or preached a, a, just a, a meeting for another church. And uh, they didn't give a love offering. He's going through hard times in his home financially. And uh, they, they didn't give him a love offering. Preached his heart out. Poured his heart out to the people. No love offering. Gets in the car. Begins driving away. And he hears a voice. And the voice was there to discourage him. God don't love you. The brethren don't love you. Your family don't love you. It just ended all. That's still, you know how many people are putting guns to their head today? Or a noose around their neck? Or a pill to their mouth? Because there's a still small voice telling them that's the best solution to their problems. And that ain't all unsafe people either, folks. That's saved people that hear the same still small voice as the unsafe people do. I can tell you, if that's the voice you're hearing, that ain't God's voice. That ain't God's voice. You got to be careful for that soft voice, that soft wind that is pictured here where he says the south wind blew softly. When you are discouraged, that spirit of Antichrist, that unholy spirit, that unholy wind will show up just to push you over the edge. Not only is this a soft wind, it's a seducing wind. Not only is it a soft wind, it's a seducing wind. You say, what do you mean? The Bible says that a lot of times I shall depart from the faith, giving heed to what? Seducing, seducing spirits. spirits. A seducing spirit is one that draws you in by whispering softly. So you begin to listen a little closer. You found it on YouTube and you had to turn up the volume. You had to put your ear a little closer to it. It begins to seduce you. It draws you in to the net. Before you know it, you can't get out. You're totally wrapped up and engulfed in it and driven away, gone with the wind, not in church anymore. Look at empty chairs this morning, people that have been driven out with a soft voice, gone with the wind. Yep. That Bible says in uh, Genesis, that Bible says the devil came to Eve there and he says, I don't think he showed up saying, Hey Eve, yay, hath God said? I think she was hanging around the tree and he says, She's like, what was that? <laughs> Got her in a little bit closer. That's that subtle, seducing voice, the soft voice of the devil, to get you to question what did God say? God had already said what he said, but the devil wanted to have his say. It's a seducing wind. It's a soft wind. It's a subtle wind. I don't have time to preach on the subtleties of the devil this morning, but it's a subtle wind. All right, not only does it blow softly, we'll look at verse 14. And not long after, there arose against it, against it a tempestuous wind called Euroclidon. See how the devil begins to up the ante? Increase the assaults and attacks on you. First, it's that soft wind to discourage you, to distress you, to make you question or doubt what did God say. Listen, if you don't think pastors get that all the time, I am generally being spoken to softly sometime between Sunday night and Monday, and my wife's coming along saying, Jeff, <laughs> it wasn't all that bad. <laughs> so are you sure? I felt like I was too hard. I felt like I, was, I didn't say enough or I didn't get across the point. That ain't God. That's the devil. Oh, yeah. Whispering yeah. those things yeah. in your ears. Yeah. How do you blow it? Yeah. You blow it. Oh. Six years later, I'm still saying yeah, the same yeah. thing. Yeah. You blew it. 
Oh, yeah. And maybe one day I will, but hey, right now, as far as I know, God has still got me here on Sunday morning preaching out of the same book that's been preached out of uh, for since 1611, and I'm so thankful for that, to be able to preach out of this Bible, this King's Bible this morning, but if you don't think the devil tomorrow, tonight's going to say, you blew it. You went too long, you cut it too short, you didn't say this, you didn't say that, you should have preached that one instead of that one. But he ups the ante. Then, came, then comes the tempestuous winds. Let me tell you what else that, that soft voice is. It's those that come to you after church and have their extra two cents. That can be the soft wind. Like, oh gosh, is that all they got out of the sermon? Is what I did say or how I misspoke? Is that what they got? I got preaching an hour and that's what they got, Lord. That's the soft. But sometimes it ramps up with a tempestuous thing. It's multiples of people. Oh. Or it's division in the camp, and now he's really attacking. <laughs> Especially if you weren't taken by the soft wind, he'll bring in a stronger wind. Not only does it blow softly, it blows strongly. This is the reason we, why we are exhorted and commanded to build our house upon the rock. Yeah. Yeah. We're exhorted to build the house upon the rock. Why? Because there's coming a day where it's not just going to be a, a soft wind blowing. You've already resisted that one. He's going to up the ante. He's going to increase the, 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 the attacks on your family. Hey, it started with a little sweet nothing there in the Garden of Eden. Before you know it, her very first two children born to her is killing one or the other. He ramped up the pressure on the family like that. <laughs> yep. Oh, boy, I'm telling you. It'll be the kids at each other's throats, you know. It'll be everything just in the home, just nothing's going right. I was preaching yesterday, these guys talking about the, the, the blessing with the curse that cars are, you know. <laughs> if the check engine don't light, get, light don't get you, it'll be the transmission. Yeah. You know, he just he knows how to attack folks. Mm -hmm. And you have to be aware of these tactics that he uses to get you to become gone with the wind. That's why we are exhorted and commanded to build our house upon the rock. Lest you build it upon the sand that is the flesh, that is yourself, that is of no good, of no value to your Christian walk. All of a sudden, if it's built upon self or the world or the flesh or religion, when the true winds come and blow that are much more stronger than the original winds that blew, it'll knock your house dry. Strong winds can start a storm. Here. A strong wind blows, and look it. They called it Euroclidon. Now, I don't know a lot about storms, but I know when they name it, yeah. it's pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> if they ever call a storm Jeff, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's usually named, I think they alternate, right? They go man, woman, man, woman to keep the thing balanced, you know? Now they just got to call it it, I guess. Yeah. But, uh, but that's the thing is when they name a storm, that's bad. That's bad. Yeah. And you know, I could name some things in your life that if they were to go bad, it'd be hard to deal with. Yeah. You know, your spouse has a name. Mm -hmm. You know, your children have a name. Mm -hmm. You know, this church has a name. You know that what will oftentimes get you to quit and give up and drive, be driven away with the wind. It's the very name of those that love you the most. Yeah. Or say they do. They're the ones that are going to hurt you the most. Yeah. Yeah. And the devil's going to use that name against you. Yeah. You know there's a name above every name? Yes. yes. <laughs> and the devil will even use that name if he can against you. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus don't love you. Jesus don't care about you. Jesus hasn't answered your prayers the way you expected him to. Look at the mess you're still in. Jesus hasn't re rescued you out of all that mess. If it's a name, if it's named, folks, it can be used against you. Don't don't think it can. That's what the Bible says: forsaking all, I press toward the mark. Yeah. Strong wind can start a storm. Mark four thirty seven, Psalm fifty five verse eight says this: I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. That's what the psalmist said: I would hasten my escape. Don't tell me that when the storm comes, you can't wait for it to get over with. <laughs> nobody looks forward to a storm, and nobody looks forward to staying in the storm. They look forward to when is it over. <laughs> Those are the words of the psalmist. 
Strong winds can strike a blow. Job 1.19. The devil brings that storm in and wipes out the family. You know what's peculiar about that whole story there? And if you believe that his kids were, re were revived and resurrected from the dead, they're all named. At least the girls are. But you know he attacked his sons and his daughters and their spouses. You know who he didn't attack? The devil. Who did he attack? The, the wife. Yeah. Ain't that a wild thought? Mm -hmm. Maybe if he had killed her, it wouldn't have done a whole lot of damage. Mm -hmm. Because she was exactly the additional pressure yeah. the devil wanted around yep. yeah. to push him over the edge. Because what did she say? Curse God and die. Yeah. If he had killed her, there was nobody to say curse God and die. Yeah, yeah. So the devil didn't touch her because she was going to be used against him. Yeah. The devil will use your spouse against you, men, right. women. <laughs> Don't think he will. But I'll say this too. Maybe, God, maybe he couldn't touch you because he says you can't touch his flesh. Mm -hmm. Amen. Oh, right. Amen. And she was born of his bone of flesh of his flesh. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe there was maybe maybe there was some protection there yeah. that God put on her, even though she didn't seem like she was deserving of it. But he'll attack your family. He'll attack your finances. He'll attack your fun. Things that you enjoy doing. He'll attack them. What did that thing shut down over the last couple years? People, places that people actually enjoyed going to. I know they weren't all places that we should that we should go to and I know they're open up they were open on Sundays and but you know when when the world was shut down for two years there was a lot of enjoyment that shut down with it. Yeah. That the world found enjoyment in. Mm -hmm. And some of it I find enjoyment in a ball game that can be fun. Mm -hmm. A movie theater that can be fun. A, a a show, a musical show, a theater, a Broadway, those things can be fun. A restaurant, those things can be fun. And they were shut down. You know what that did for the joy of the world? And shut it down. Yeah. And shut down their fun. It made them more miserable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what the devil will do to you? He'll shut down the things that are fun in your life. Yeah. Just to get you to quit on God. Yeah. Just to get you to quit on life. Just to make you so miserable that you cannot enjoy your salvation anymore. He don't care what he has to attack as long as you're not serving God. Job chapter 8 verse 2 says this, How long wilt thou speak these things? And how long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? Words are like it of the strong winds. Why? Because strong winds of words can stir up strife. <coughs> Our words can stir up strife, which creates a very big storm in our life. You say, what do you mean by strong words? Strong arguments. You ever get in a strong argument with your spouse or with a co-worker or with a friend and all of a sudden words are coming out of your mouth? Strong words. Angry words are flying out of your mouth. You had no idea that were even in your heart. What a storm that could stir up. Huh? And what happens when a storm comes? You know what it does? It pulls up all the stuff that's been under the surface and it brings all that nasty stuff up to the surface and eventually it'll drive it away. But for a while, you got to deal with all that dirt and all that filth and all that trash that have been buried under the sand or under the whatever pile you got at the house. All those strong words stir up strife and it brings all of that stuff back to the top. You ever get in an argument with your wife and she says, well, I remember what you did when... But that's under the blood. We forgave it. Yeah, but now we're angry again. I'm going back to the well. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, you've never been in a strong argument. Yeah. And that's not just a marriage couple's. That can be with your children if they're older. Yeah. Yeah. It's so weird like how they how you never talk to a child a certain way until they hit a certain age. Now all of a sudden, mm -hmm. we talk to them a little bit differently than we used to talk to them in the house. Because yeah. they're adults now. Yeah. It's just... Words, strong arguments, strong opinions. Are there any opinionated people in here? Don't raise your hand, Gary. <laughs> Are there any opinionated people in here? Strong opinions can create storms. Not every opinion has to be delivered. You know, Elihu, Elihu waits almost the entire book of Job. And then he says, I'm going to give you my opinion. 
And opinions are in the Bible. They're there. Elihu had one, and it was a good opinion. But he waited until they exhausted their arguments, and then he gave his opinion. Not every opinion has to be stated. Because sometimes our opinions are going to rub people the wrong way. As true as they might be, as accurate as they might be, they're not always a blessing to hear. As you can probably keep some of your opinions... We like to use that verse, you know, if I, if, if I have a problem with my brother and my sister, I go to them. Yeah. Well, make sure it's a genuine problem and not just an opinion you have about them. Yeah. Or an opinion about things. Because all you can do is stir up strife. And the devil doesn't care what he's got to use. He will use an opinion. A small matter, a small member. Small soft winds can blow ships off course. Small words can do great damage. They carry a lot of weight. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It was the greatest lie ever told as a nursery rhyme. Yeah. That Bible says that words are as wounds. They go down to the inner part of the belly. Right. Words are powerful things. That's why he calls the word of God. It's quick and powerful. Words are very powerful, whether they be God's words or your words yeah. or Satan's words. The whole entire course of human history turned mm -hmm. on words. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. On words. Strong arm tactics. Strong arm tactics. Yeah. If you don't, if you don't do what I want you to do, if you don't do what I want you to do, strong arm tactics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pastor, if you don't do this, we're leaving the church. Yeah. And then they happens all the time. Pastor, I'm the biggest giver in the church. You don't, you can't afford. I told the guys yesterday when we lost people in this church. I thought, God, the whole thing is going to dry up and shrivel up because you know what God done? He's replenished it somehow. Oh, amen. Yeah, Somebody's yeah. here is giving away exceeding the abundance of all that I can ask or think. Mm -hmm. Less people and the, and the offerings are as high or if not higher amen. sometimes amen. than when we had more people in the church. I don't know what that's about, amen. but that's what they'll do. They'll strong, and the devil will do that to you. Yeah. He'll strong arm you. He'll say, now, Pastor. If you preach that, now, Pastor, if you yeah. touch on that subject, yeah. Yeah. it's going to rub somebody the wrong way and they're not going to want to stay. And God's like, if you don't preach on it, mm -hmm. whose voice do I listen to? Yeah. Yeah. They both speak softly. They both speak loudly. They both speak strongly. Yeah. Yeah. you got to know who to listen to and you have to be willing and submissive to God. Otherwise, you'll end up becoming God with the wind. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, verse 10, only by pride cometh contention. Boy, I wish we could just remember that. That when there's contention in church, when there's contention in the family, it's one thing and one thing only. Only by pride cometh contention. Only by pride. That's the only time in the Bible where it says, only by this or that cometh this or that. Only by pride if there's contention in church, if there's contention with your children, if there's contention with your spouse, if there's contention on the job, it may not be your pride, but somebody's pride is creating the contention. If there's contention between you and God, God ain't the God of pride. That's right, amen. The Bible says he made the devil that way yeah. without fear. He's the, he's the king over the children of pride. Only by pride cometh contention. If you find an argument that you're in the midst of and it's contentious, you have to ask yourself, either I am proud or the yeah. one I'm speaking to is proud because they won't hear me. Yeah. And they won't be corrected. I got these two quotes from Brother uh, Hatley down in, um, in Tennessee, Miss Carol's old uh, pastor. He gave me two quotes. Never waste time explaining yourself to people committed to misunderstanding you. <laughs> Never waste time explaining yourself to people committed to misunderstanding you. Yeah. More time is wasted trying to get people to see our way of mm -hmm. seeing things, and they won't see it because they will always misunderstand yeah. everything you have to say. Yeah. And then the second, now that matches only by pride cometh contention. Yeah. Yeah. You're trying to explain it, but their pride will not allow them to hear, therefore it makes the conversation contentious. Yeah. Yeah. And then he said this, he said, pride wins many arguments, but it loses many relationships. Yeah, yeah. What's more important to you, your relationship with God or your pride? Mm -hmm. 
As I said to the men yesterday, I said a lot of folks will say, Pastor, I'm leaving the church because of this or that. And the question, and the reply is, well, I'm glad you came for this or that and not for God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there yeah. you go, yeah. Listen, if you're coming here for anything other than God, it's easy to leave for anything other than God. That's right. Mm -hmm. Good point. The day that I quit preaching that book is the day you ought to go. Amen. Yeah. Unless God takes you with his wind into another town too far away to drive, I'm not going to give you a reason to leave doctrinally. Yeah. I might give you other reasons, yeah. but it ain't going to be God telling you to leave. That'll be the time the devil will say, see, he got that one wrong. Mm -hmm. He preached it with the wrong spirit. He said this, and he should have said that. Well, look it. See, going late. Proverbs or Acts 27 again. It blows softly. It blows strongly. And then I made up a word to keep the yeses intact. Look mm -hmm. at verse 15. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. It blows softly. That's the first attack, subtle seducing. Then it blows strongly. He's ramping up the attacks on you and your life and your faith. Once he gets you to that strong wind it, and it catches you, he don't let you go. It blows snaringly. It's not a real word. It blows snaringly. A snare is a trap. Right. Mm -hmm. A snare is a net. A snare is something that's there to catch you. He may not have got you with a soft wind, but if he does at the soft or with the strong wind, and generally, he ain't got to go much more than the strong wind. He's used both ends of the, of, of the spectrum as tactics, soft and strong. If he gets you with one of those things, guess what? You're caught. If you don't resist, and if you don't submit to God, and if you don't follow God's words, and if you don't just be still and know that I am God type of things, if you get caught up in it, you're caught up. There's, no, there's nothing else to do. Once you're caught up in that wind, you're caught. It's a snare. It's a trap. Once the wind catches the ship, it will not let it go. Once the devil has you, he is not going to let you go. He will use every tactic in the book to, to get you like he did with Job, and like he did with Paul, he will do every tactic in the book to get you, but until he gets you, he ain't got you. But once he gets you, he ain't letting go, folks. He will not let up. He will not let you go. I don't care how much you ask him. I don't care how much you beg him. I don't care how much you want to bribe him. Once the devil's got you in his trap, he will not let you go. Your adversary, the roaring lion, as a, as, a, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That is, that once you're in his jaws, once you're in his clutches, his only mindset is to devour you. Yeah. Never let you go. You ever watch those Animal Planet shows? They wait for them to become isolated. Watch. They wait for them to become weak and be weagered. And then what do they do? They go. And once those lions get those gazelles and those zebras that have been isolated from the herd and weakened in the herd, once he's got them, he don't start playing cards with them. He don't start playing tic-tac-toe three in a row. He eats them. He don't care about the family. It ain't got a conscience. He don't care what... what it had plans to do later on that day. He doesn't care about you and the plans that God has for your life. His only goal is to get you, and once he's got you, to not let you go. That's it. That's why, says be, that's why we're supposed to be sober. Be vigilant. Head on a swivel. Why? Because of the soft wind that blows. Because of the strong winds that blow. Say, Pastor, what happens if somebody gets caught up in a wind? Soft or strong, what happens? There's only one thing you can do, folks. Look at verse 15. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, what do you do? You got to let her drive. There's nothing you can do for somebody who is caught up in the winds of false doctrine, the winds of anger, the winds of bitterness. You have got to let that thing run its course. 
Because you cannot rescue them. Yeah. Once they are in the jaws of Satan, once they have been snared, once they have been entrapped, there is no getting them out. He says that once the ship was caught, we could not bear up into the wind. We had to just let her drive. Other thing, run its course. Now I'm thankful that when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of us and we let him drive, he takes us to places you could never imagine. Yeah, amen. I wish I could preach this this morning with confidence saying the wind here is God's wind. It's the Holy Spirit's wind. But the Bible said in verse 4, the winds were contrary. And Paul said, don't go. How do we even get into this mess? They didn't obey the preacher when he preached a message of don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go. It's dangerous. He's bad. She's bad. That's bad. The world is bad. Don't go. Don't go. And they say, we're going to go anyways, preacher. Thank you very much. What do you do for someone like that? Chain to the pew? When their mind is made up, what do you do? You let them drive. You let them go. You can't keep them. The devil's got them. And you're not stronger than the devil. What do you do? You let them go. You pray for them. And you say, God, let them run their ship aground sooner rather than later so it ain't got to get dragged out. But God, I, I've done all I can do. They got to go, Lord. You got family members that you're hanging on to trying to rescue them and save them. It comes to a point where they are caught up in their snare and you got to let them go. There's some relations that are a whole lot better letting them go than trying to keep yeah, them. Because yeah, yeah. yeah. that's exactly what the devil wants to get you. Yeah. Yeah. He wants to, listen, you know how it is. If you're a lifeguard and they're trying to rescue somebody, if they resist, if they fight, if they flail, you know, brother uh, Tim, you were out there in California around the beaches area and stuff. You know what it is that when they're going down, if they don't submit to the lifeguard, the lifeguard's got to do what? Let him go. He's got to let them go. If the lifeguard can't save them because they will not be saved and they're freaking out and they're spazzing out and they're flailing and flapping rather than just submitting, the lifeguard's got to let them go. Why? Because you'll have two people drown. It's, a, it's an application. It's when I saw this thing here, uh, it bothered me. I said, Lord, certainly that cannot be the way you're supposed to treat people when they get to this place. Then he says, how about that guy over there? I delivered him to Satan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians chapter 5, I delivered this man unto Satan that the spirit may be saved in the day of Christ. He says over there about Hymenaeus and Philetus, he says that he says that they are going to make some more shipwreck. So God, deliver him over to Satan. In 1 Timothy chapter number one, uh, 2 there, or 1 there. Some people, if you don't let them shipwreck themselves, yeah. they're going to shipwreck you. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. All that you can do is let them drive until they're shipwrecked. See, what do you, what, look, at, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. I promise we're almost done. 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look, 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. <laughs> These are people that are a danger to themselves. In meekness, instructing those, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, if God will give them repentance, and that they, that they, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Listen, you cannot recover them. They have to recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. All you can do is pray for them. All you can do is in meekness try to help them. But there comes a time you got to let them go and deliver them over to God and say, God, they're all yours. I mean, they always were anyway, but I was trying harder than I probably should and could. God, you gotta, they got to go. And it says there that they... They recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Mm. So what is that? That's let them run shipwrecked. Yep. Mm -hmm. go, go over to Acts 27 again. We'll close with this. Acts 27. Listen, there's folks that have left this church that I still pray for them when God brings them to remembrance, but there is no way I can do anything more than I've already done. Yeah. 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 
You pray for them. You show them scripture. You show them where their doctrine is bad or where their behavior is bad. And you're trying to instruct them in meekness. You're trying to help them. And you give them rope and you give them life and you give them life jackets and life preservers. And you do all you can, but eventually they're going to drag you and drag others down. You just got to say, it's time to go. And there's people like that in your life. Yeah. Acts 27, look at uh, verse, uh, verse 40. When they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves under the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoist up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground. That's where a lot of folks will have to end up is they have to run their ship aground. Yep. And the forepart stuck fast and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. See, even after your ship has run aground, the devil still ain't done with you. He wants to make sure you never get back in the fight. He wants to make sure you never get reconciled back to your brother and sister. He wants to make sure your marriage never becomes healthy once again. He wants to make sure you're destroyed. He wants to go beyond that. And I thank God for his protection. Yeah, yeah. I thank God that nothing gets in that circle, in that hedge, and nothing that happens within that hedge goes past the will and the protective hand of God. The devil cannot do more to you than God allows him to do. Yeah, yeah. And the soldiers, they want to kill you. That's the devil's servants. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose. I am thankful that God keeps the devil more often than not from his purpose. Amen. His purpose is to destroy this church, destroy my family, and destroy my faith. Amen. And I thank God for his unseen hand that God does not always allow the devil to come into my life and affect me the way that he wants to. I mean, he comes in, don't get me wrong. I got to deal with things, don't get me wrong. But I'm thankful it's all the time. Many times that God says, not today, sonny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not today. Yeah. And he says there, he says that they should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on board, and some on broken pieces out of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. I'm thankful that if we're all saved. Yeah. Regardless if we are saved and shipwrecked or saved and serving God, and Paul was the only one, yeah. but I'm thankful we're all going to make it safe to land. Yeah. Aren't you? Yeah. I'm thankful we're all going to go over to view the land. I'm thankful we're all going to be standing there on Jordan's stormy bank I stand and cast a wishful eye. I'm thankful that in spite of all the devil's attempts and many of his successes, that one day the rapture is going to happen and God is going to deliver all of his children, all of his saints, out of the storms, out of the troubles, out of the skirmishes, out of the strong winds, out of the soft winds, out of the seducing spirits and darks and devils. God is going to take us out of here. Amen. And we're all going to be forevermore on the happy golden Amen. shore. Amen. And we're all going to get along. Yeah. And we're all going to love each other. Yeah. And we're all going to be united. And we're all going to be serving God and praising God and thanking God and rejoicing God. Yeah. And eventually we're going to see that old devil that gave us a fit be cast in the lake of fire, yeah. burning with yeah. brimstone forever yeah. and ever yeah. and ever yeah. and ever. Yeah. So what do I say? I say try the spirits. Yeah. Whether they be of God. I say be filled with the Spirit so you can discern yeah. the soft voices and the strong voices in your life. Because some of them there are there to help you and some of them there are there to hurt you. Yeah. We need to discern the spirits, try the spirits, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and we need to be praying for one another. Yeah. That even if we're doing it, pray for one another that they may do it also. Yeah. Amen. Let's close in a word for our Heavenly Father.